Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to GMM for the limited Q2 FY24 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference call over to Ms. Priyanka Daga from GMM Fordler Limited. Please, thank you and over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sagar. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you into the quarter 2 FY24 earnings call of GMM Fordler Limited. The earnings presentation was uploaded on the stock exchanges today and is also available on our website. Hope all of you had a chance to go through it. From the management, we have with us our Managing Director, Mr. Tarak Patel, our CEO of International Business, Mr. Thomas Scales, our CEO of India Business, Mr. Asim Joshi, our CFO of International Business, Mr. Alexander Pompner, and our CFO of India Business, Mr. Manish Kodar, and our Compliance Officer, Ms. Mittal Mehta. We will give you a brief overview of the performance of the company, after which we will get into the Q&A. Before we begin with the overview, a brief disclaimer. The presentation which we uploaded on the stock exchange and on our website, including our call discussions that will happen now, contains or may have certain forward-looking statements regarding our business prospects and profitability, which are subject to several risks and uncertainties. Actual results could materially differ from those in such forward-looking statements. I will now hand over the call to Mr. Patel to provide an overview of the performance. Over to you, Mr. Sarat. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, good evening, everybody. We are happy to report a strong performance this quarter with both revenue and profitability in line with our FY25 guidance. Revenue growth was driven by strong execution across international and the India businesses. Profitability improvement in the international business driven by operational excellence and pricing improvements. A good point to note today is that the international business has recorded the highest ever profitability in this quarter. Order intake, however, remains a bit subdued uh, in technologies and systems due to a general weakness in uh, the chemical sector. Services remain on track. However, our strategy of diversification and entering new industry segments has led to a strong opportunity pipeline across all business platforms, and we continue to focus our efforts on strengthening our market share uh, in the next few quarters. Uh, having said that, our order backlog stands at about 705 crores, which translates to about six months of order visibility in India and about seven to eight months in the international business. Uh, our order intake for the month of October has been quite strong, and it's around between the 250 to 270 crore mark. So uh, October has been a good month in terms of order intake. Uh, some of the other uh, salient points about this quarter, we also had a global strategy meet in Munich where 30 of our senior professionals from across geographies uh, participated. Uh, this is in line with building a long-term st uh, strategic plan and hopefully uh, by the end of this calendar, uh, by the end of this financial year, we should be able to host an investor day uh, to update investors in terms of our long-term vision. We also opened up two new service centers, one in Brazil and one in Italy. These both these service centers are for the mechanical steel industry business and will add to uh, improved services in, this, in these regions. In terms of financial performance, our consolidated revenue for the quarter grew by 20% to 937 crores with an EBITDA of 142 crores, which translates to about 15% EBITDA margin. Uh, which is about 20% higher than last year. Uh, our current quarter, like I mentioned, the improvement in profitability, profitability was mainly driven by the international business, largely, largely due to their strong execution and pricing improvements. Uh, we are also continuing to look at internal cost uh, efficiencies, and this is something that we will keep our eyes on, and this is something that over the next few quarters will be quite important in terms of improving and maintaining profitability. In terms of corporate updates, uh, DBAG's Fund 6 has sold 13.6%, out of which 9.9% was bought by Chris Capital. 
1% uh, it still remains with DBAG, which obviously the Patel family has promised to acquire. Now that all the approvals have been received, the French approval actually came only yesterday, we plan to complete this transaction uh, in the next um, week or so, uh, probably around November the 20th. Uh, this transaction will happen at 1700 rupees per share, which was agreed uh, at the time of the last sell-down. Uh, DBAG's nominee director, Mr. Mose Wabari and Harsh Gupta have both resigned since then. And today, our current board has six directors, out of which four are independent. And lastly, I'm also happy to inform you that we've signed an agreement to purchase 100% stake in Mixflow. This is a mixing company based in Ontario, Canada, for a consideration of about $7 million. The transaction is expected to complete by November 31st. And like I've said in the past few quarterly updates, that mixing is an important business for us. We have a strategy in place. We are building on that strategy. And mixing will continue to be a growth driver, both in terms of revenue and profitability. I will now hand over the call to Manish Todar, our CFO of the India business. And he will take you through the financial performance of the company. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Good evening, all. So YTD, our revenue was at 1850 crores up 22% and the EBITDA is at 274 crores, up 27% uh, at an EBITDA margin of 14.8% for H1. So as an organization, uh, going on to balance sheet primarily, uh, as an organization we continue to focus on making the balance sheet stronger. With that in thing, uh, we have reduced our long-term debt by 27 crores uh, in H1, uh, which includes the 29 crores of prepayment. In H2, we have a planned repayment for 51 crores, uh, but we think we, we should be able to prepay some more uh, debt, a long-term debt during H2. And so therefore, overall, in this financial year, we should be uh, reducing our long-term debt by something like 140 crores plus minus. Uh, our interest costs have also reduced in H1 by uh, approximately 20 basis points, primarily in India, and now at consolidate, uh, carries an interest rate of 7.5% and 8.1% share in India. This reflects the confidence of our lenders in the business. And as a recall, we continue to enjoy double minus trade trading at the peak of our state uh, versus when we were uh, at our uh, when we were at day three. Also, on the other avenues, uh, we continue to identify non-critical, non-core uh, balance sheet items, and we uh, will try to get it a bit more leaner and all that. So therefore, you see a small item on the asset sales for sale for this uh, year as well. Moving on to, if you refer uh, slide number nine on the working capital, our tables are in the control at 48 days. Uh, inventories have also reduced uh, in past six months by something like 70 crores. However, uh, if you see the customer advances that have reduced from 406 crores to 270 crores. So that's the combination, uh, and that's the uh, biggest item for us as an area of improvement for us. Uh, that reduction is primarily on account of two, uh, two reasons. One, our backlog has reduced uh, versus March versus September. So that's one count. And uh, as a percentage to say, customer advances as a percentage to uh, backlog was 19% in March, uh, has reduced to 16% in September. So these two factors have led to this uh, reduction in the customer advances. Uh, now moving on to the cash flow, if we see uh, on slide number 10, the 251 crores of cash generation uh, primarily has got consumed uh, within the business for this H1. Uh, the biggest item of that is the working capital. And uh, the working capital, there were two reasons. One was the customer advances as we just discussed. And the other reason was has been the POC increase in Mavas for some like 50 crores for this <coughs> half year. Uh, and as, as you know, Mavas, we have been running a huge uh, operational excellence program. And as the manufacturing goes on and this uh, POC reduces, we should be able to liquidate a lot of testing uh, H2. With uh, that, I'll just start with the call back to uh, Priyanka. Thank you, Mani. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to join the question queue may press star and one on their touchstone phone. 
if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Sanjay Shah from KSA Securities Private Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, gentlemen. Sir, uh, first of all, wish you all a happy Diwali and uh, a great year ahead. So my question was regarding uh, the the order intake, which is drifting towards the service side, uh, that you which you mentioned in your presentation also. So, Tarak sir, can you highlight upon the service side in detail to make uh, us understand what is this and how do you see that panning ahead uh, the other business too? Uh, Sanjay, right. thank you so much and happy Diwali to you as well. Uh, just to understand the business, we break our businesses into three main verticals. Technology, which includes glass line and non-glass line equipment. We have a systems business, which is basically any of our equipment around which we build complete systems, automation, uh, etc., built into it. And then we have a services business, which is uh, basically uh, service mandates that we have internationally and in India. We have spare parts, we have re-glass. Uh, we have pipes and fittings, so these are things that are used to service our equipment. And as a company today, at a consolidated consolidated level, about 35 to 40 percent of our revenues comes from services. One important aspect to consider is the backlog that is currently available of 1700 odd crores uh, does not have a lot of service component because these are obviously fast moving. So over the next few months and quarters, you will see search revenue kind of uh, be something that comes. It's quite stable. It will continue to happen and it will continue to be shipped out. This is not really long term backlog that gets added onto the backlog. So, over the next few months and quarters, you will see that the service business will continue to add to the backlog. Uh, the other difference in terms of the international business and the India business, the international business obviously has a much larger component of services. India is currently around the 9 to 10% mark. We have plans to improve that and bring that up to. A double digit. So that's something that we are working on. Services, like you know, is very profitable and something that we have a lot of, uh, you know, focus on in creating service centers, placing service centers in the right geographies, and making sure that services is something that we can be proactive about. Uh, our future goals, our, our, you know, our strategic intent really is to not only stop at servicing our own equipment but we should also be able to service other equipment as well in a chemical or pharmaceutical plant. So as management, uh, you know, we believe that service is going to continue to grow. It is very profitable and we want to make sure that our service offering increases over time. Um, you know, having said that, uh, services again is something that gets kind of related to CapEx. So when CapEx increases, services may decrease a little bit, but when CapEx slows down, People want to take better care of the equipment and make sure that they have much more upside and hence their spend on services will increase. Uh, that's the general overview on services. Um, happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. It's really helpful. I'll come back in queue for further more questions. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question is from the line of Charlene Choksi from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello team. Uh, firstly, congratulations on a good set of numbers. I had a few questions. Uh, firstly, on the order inflows, which we, we know have been relatively weaker, uh, does this translate into any change in revenue or EBITDA guidance? And what, what sort of visibility on the domestic and international business does the current order backlog provide? So in terms of this year's outlook, I don't think anything changes. I think we are in a very strong position to finish the year as planned. Uh, as management, we are also very aligned in terms of what our strategic direction is in terms of order intakes. We know that we've had a couple of quarters of slightly lower intake than we, what we would have liked. But having seen a strong October, we believe that over the next few months, quarters, we will be able to build the backlog. There have been some large projects that we have won and that we still expect to win as well. Uh, these are projects that have got pushed out just because of the slowdown in the chemical industry. We expect some of these projects to now materialize in November and in December. 
So from that perspective, I think this year is completely shorted. We are at par, as you would have known also in terms of both revenue and profitability, we are perfectly on plan. Uh, our focus now really is changing to next year. Uh, as management, we are aware and we are ready for the fight. Uh, we are aggressive in the market. At the same time, we are also looking very, very strongly at our internal cost structure. Is there opportunities within the company to rationalize manufacturing footprint? Is there opportunity to reduce cost? All those things are being worked on. Uh, but in all in all, I think the next six to nine months could be slightly slower than expected, but I believe that the chemical industry will come back strongly. Pharma has already seen a bit of pickup, uh, and I believe that uh, we are in a strong footing to kind of take advantage of that. So no change in revenue or profitability guidance, and I think for this year, I think we are uh, quite strong, and we expect to complete the year uh, just like what we started. Okay, and my other question was on the standalone business, where wherein revenue growth has been pretty slow at about 4%, and EBITDA margins have been flattish sequentially. Firstly, what, what slowed down the revenue growth in the standalone business? And you'd earlier indicated that uh, we can do about 15 to 16 percent EBITDA margins in the standalone business. How is that tracking? Because to achieve that, it, it means we'll have to do about 17 percent in H2. So I think, uh, Shari, yes, uh, on a EBITDA margin, I, I, uh, we have been tracking at some place between 14, 14 and a half for things. Uh, and as Tarek mentioned, next six to nine uh, nine months look not all that uh, super exciting. So, uh, better part of this year, probably we should be in this range only for for the rest of the year in channel numbers. On the uh, or top line, you know, yeah, it's kind of nice to see three months of tax. So, the line wasn't very clear, but I understood you were asking about top line growth in India in the standalone business, right? So. Look, I think uh, we all recognize that the uh, uh, market in India has been fairly challenging for the last six to nine months, uh, especially in the chemical and um, pharmaceutical segments. Uh, what we have done is uh, been a lot, a lot more aggressive in the market in these segments and also focused on our exposure or increasing our exposure in other segments. So, for example, oil and gas, uh, minerals and mining, uh, and a few others. Uh, with our mixing business, with our XLI business and things like that. So while um, the growth has uh, not been as high as it seems to be in the past, uh, we believe once the uh, core uh, industrial segments return to growth, uh, combined with our increased focus on other segments, I think you know we're pretty confident that we'll get back to our uh, traditional growth rate and therefore also get our margin profiles back to where we uh, normally are. Oh, sure, that's useful. And if and um, if I may, just another question. Uh, if, if you could provide some color on how the raw material prices are tracking now and whether any high cost inventory that still remains with us. That's all. Thank you and all the best. Thanks, sir. Uh, yeah, raw materials now have thankfully cooled down. They're not back to where they were before the spike, but uh, uh, you know, there's sort of the, the, the up and down that we've seen and the, has, has uh, steadied. Um, most of the high cost inventory is now flushed out um, and we're buying inventory at market and uh, using it. Okay, thank you. Thank you and all the best. Thank you very much. The next question is from the line of Kaushik Mohan from Ashika Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, congratulations for the numbers and uh, happy Diwali. Sir, my major question is coming on the uh, glass line side because our market share, uh, like if we talk about the entire uh, uh, TAM for this entire business is somewhere around uh, $1 billion. That comes out to the Indian rupee of 8,000 crores. Or uh, let's assume like 8,300 crores. So, and uh, because uh, currently we are in a uh, run rate of revenue somewhere around 3,178 crores, which is which closed in the last year. And also by seeing that uh, last two, two quarters, uh, we are also very near to uh, 2,000 crores. That comes to 1,900 crores. So uh, what will be the, uh, because of this reason, we are entering into mixed crores, that is $3 billion uh, uh, dollar market. I understand that that is 25,000 crore market share is there, market is there. We are getting into that. But how about this one liter GMM for the core business that is glass line? What, what are we looking out here? 
are we going to take the market share of DD Trish, which is the market leader in the world? Yeah. So I, this is a theme I'll, uh, I'll start off and then perhaps Thomas or uh, start off my own eyes. Uh, look, the offline uh, business is, as you rightly mentioned, our core business, uh, and we're definitely focused on maintaining our share there. Uh, while our share varies across different regions of the world, roughly speaking, we're you know, at 40 to 50 percent market share globally. Um, you did mention correctly that the market globally is about a billion dollars, but obviously, as the cycle uh, in this, as the capex cycle in these in the chemical pharmaceutical segments have uh, has has slowed down, you know, for for a temporary period, that market also slows down a little bit, right? So we are very confident that we are, if not protecting, actually we believe we've gained share in the last six months because we've been a lot more aggressive um, in in ensuring that uh, uh, we capture the orders that are out there. Uh, and we're confident certainly all the major project orders have come to GM and Bordler. Uh, as far as Mixer is concerned, of course, that's a, or, or the mixing business broadly is concerned, that's a separate segment. Uh, we've always had a mixing business. We believe it's a good business and therefore we're expanding in it. But it's an independent separate business, um, you know, that gives us a little more diversification and, um, and breadth uh, of exposure. Okay. Yeah, from the national point of view, the market share is also on quite high in all the regions that we serve, in major regions, we have a good position there. And our strategy always has been to maintain this market share. However, during the last two, three years, we have been able to increase market share, especially in Europe, where we have uh, been able to cater to some of the regions that we haven't been able to get a foothold in, like uh, South Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. And this was due to the EPIC program where we import uh, vessels from India, made in India, finishing them up in uh, our sites in Europe and shipping to the customer. And this was incremental business for us and thus we have uh, gained market share the last few years. And our goal is still to, to, to maintain that. Okay, and just to add on the mixing business more strategic rather than what, you know, what our plan is. So, as you know, we've always had a mixing business in India. It's close to about, what, 20 odd million dollars. That was the starting point. We then acquired a company in France called Mixcell around 12 to 15 million dollars uh, of revenue, also having a facility in China. So we are now present in India, in Europe, and in China. Recently, we completed the acquisition of Mixpro, uh, which is in Canada. So now we have access to North America and South America, right? So as part of the global strategy, we wanted to be a global player when it came to mixing, which is now completed. We've also looked at resources and organizations for mixing. Uh, we have also kind of, we are in the process of bringing in somebody to run the mixing business. I think that's something that will really have a dedicated uh, focus on the business with a clear strategy, go-to-market strategy. Mixing is something that, again, makes a lot of difference for the customer. It's a technology play. It has reduced batch time. It has improved a power consumption that has reduced costs, right? So many more companies are looking at mixing now. Uh, people are talking to us about mixing in a more technical manner as well. So this is definitely an area that we want to uh, focus on. And like I mentioned, mixing goes across many different industries, right? So metals and minerals, water treatment, uh, pain, it goes into food and beverage, it goes into a uh, cosmetic. So the list is really, really long. Obviously, we're not going to play in all the areas, but we're going to pick and choose areas where we have a strong footing. And our idea is to be in the top, you know, five mixing companies in the world. I mean, obviously, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think the progress that we've made so far, both with the acquisition and both with the resources that we've added, I think over the next few years, you will see the mixing business really kind of grow at a much faster pace than our last one did. Uh, the other thing, just to kind of close out this question, is that even though Glassline is what we're known for, Glassline, at the start, maybe two or three years ago, accounted for nearly 70% of our revenue. Our idea as management is to bring that down to 50%. Right? 50% should be Glassline, and the rest of the 50% should come from non-Glassline and services and systems. Right? That is really the goal, to mitigate the risk and the exposure that we have in Glassline. Uh, we have kind of built a portfolio of non glass line products, right? And these products are growing much faster, have much bigger markets that we can cater to. Uh, their TAMs are much bigger. 
uh, and hence we believe that this is going to be the kind of structural change in the business over the next maybe two or three years. We will always be the market leader in glass line, but the share of glass line within our total revenue will probably come down to close to 50%. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, our entire revenue of uh, Glassman is currently around, uh, if, I, if I assume on the broader terms, uh, in the last year we have closed around uh, 3,178 crores. If I assume even we'll do this year 3,000 crores, uh, that means that in next coming five years we have another 50% market coming from only from mixed line. That means our entire uh, sales will somewhere around look like around 6,000 crores. Uh, then what will be our uh, margins? Wh which which line of margins will be taken? Because currently, if we look at margin, uh, the glass line India business is doing great than the uh, uh, Fordler business that we have it. Uh, how about mixing? In mixing business, what kind of margins that we'll do? If possible, can you give all the three segments which I'm talking about their uh, EBITDA level margins, if you have some guidance? Yeah, so I think just a couple of points here. One, I mean, you went to the numbers quite far and I'm not sure if I agree with all the numbers. I will just kind of give you an overview. Glass line margins, yes, are quite strong, have been quite strong, but even our non-glass line businesses today are generating similar levels of profitability, right? So none of the business lines that we've added are going to be detrimental to margin. They're going to add and improve the margin profile. Our mixing business may be in some cases already higher than glass line, right? So there is definitely technology sales that we're doing in mixing in systems where we are getting probably better margins than we are in dark line. Again, uh, the only business that we have today within the group that probably is slightly lower than dark line would be in, uh, the heavy engineering business. But again, there we have a clear strategy of picking and choosing the right metallurgy, uh, export versus domestic, and making sure that our margin profile is close to maybe 12 to 15 percent there, right? But the rest of the product lines that we have. Anything that goes into chemical processing should generate 15 to 20 percent margin profile, if not more. Services and systems obviously will give you a lot more. And then our industry business again, again has a very high margin profile, right? So I think that's the general overview. We don't expect significant change in margin profile just because we are reducing the gas line share. We are replacing that, uh, or we are adding new businesses that are also kind of. Um, margin accretive rather than dilute. Uh, sir, uh, um, I, my repeated question on this, but a uh, little bit clarity. In the glass line business, India business currently is somewhere around 16% less. So, can we maintain these margins in India business and in non India business, that is international business, somewhere around 12%? In mixed line, what kind of percentage is that? In mixing? Uh, in India business, what is our EBITDA margin? In non-India business, that is international business, glass line, what is our margin? In yeah, mixed so line, what would be our margin? I think that those are the right numbers in terms of general guidelines. I think India margins can improve a little bit with operational efficiencies and things like that. If the market dynamics were to change and the market demand were to increase, then automatically prices would increase and hence our margins would go up. Uh, internationally, also, you can say uh, the, the dark line mar uh, margins will remain stable. Uh, and I, I didn't really clearly say, uh, I think you said mixed line. I'm not sure what that meant. But the mixing business is between the 15 to 20 percent margin profile currently. The idea is obviously to grow that margin and improve that margin as we consolidate, as we have a clear strategy, as we have a clear go to market strategy. We want to improve margins, definitely. Got it. Uh, sir, I'll get back in the line. I have some more questions. Thanks. Yes, uh, sorry for that. The next question is from the line of uh, Mr. Pramod Dangi from Unifree Investment Management LLP. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Tarak and team. Uh, congratulations for good uh, growth momentum. Uh, just uh, two questions. One is you said that uh, you know pharma started seeing some momentum uh, building up in India, but chemical is still you know uh, sluggish. So you know uh, on the any the while our order book is still low, uh, do we see any kind of the announcement for the new capex building up in the pharma or the Chemical, where you can see that uh, the customers are 
now planning for the new capex Mm. Yeah, so I think there's two points here. One is I don't think our order book is low. I think we are comfortable. The problem is that the market was super hot. So our, our order book, obviously, a few quarters ago was incredible. It was a lot. It was much higher, but it's not the general tendency to have such a high order book. So I think that's something to just keep in mind. We are still at a very comfortable position. Maybe not at the highest level that we were. But that market was definitely inflated and super hot, right? Uh, keeping that in mind, like I said, we are at a comfortable level, and that uh, we believe that this order book can continue to grow because some of these opportunities that we are working on, which are delayed, will only kind of materialize in the coming quarters, and I think we should be in a good position there. Coming back to your question about pharmaceutical investment specifically, and I'll let Thomas answer for the international bills in India. We do believe that things are kind of improving. We have been seeing some traction on the ground, especially in Hyderabad. We've seen some stuff happening in Gujarat and in Mumbai as well. Pharma is coming back. I think the real play for pharma is going to be in the next financial year. The FI25 is where pharma will invest. I think some of them have already started building capacity to cater to the demand in FI25. Uh, some of the bigger guys, like DB, has already announced Unit 3. They've already placed the first round of orders. Loris is expanded. Newland is expanding. Um, we have uh, expansion in MSN as well. So those guys are expanding. We have Cicla and Sun Pharma looking at small expansion. Heiko looking at small expansion. So yes, there is definitely more momentum in uh, pharmaceuticals. And maybe, Thomas, internationally, you would like to say something on the pharma business or the pharma sector. Yeah, the pharma sector is still strong and growing, uh, as well in the Americas as well as in Europe. In America, our order intake that is driven by pharma or project is quite strong still. Um, we also have increased basically our service above expectations in the, in the Americas. Uh, Europe, we have to say that the pharma uh, industry is still investing and, and, and the bottlenecking and uh, repairing. So what we are seeing is an intact market there. However, the, the heat, the, the overheated uh, uh, mode is, is somewhat over. Things are back to normal. Decision times are taking a bit longer or back to normal times. And uh, this is quite, quite good news. Where we see some significant weakness at this point is in China, and China pharmaceutical as well as chemical markets are very, very slow right now. Uh, the capacities seem to be at a, at a high level at this point, but uh, both pharmaceutical and chemical is quite large in China, as you know, from a global point of view, and those investments will come back, and uh, when they come back, maybe they come back strong. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, and and uh, secondly, on our you know um, uh, stock and sell strategy, uh, where we are supposed to uh, supply around 28, 30 uh, reactors to the Germany or the European facility. How that setting up? Uh, what kind of you know uh, the you know sections uh, we are seeing over there uh, in terms of the uh, customer offtake? If you can give some update on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, difficult to understand, but I think you want the uh, question about the stock and sale program that we have initiated and started. Uh, we yes. have that it is still huge success. It's ongoing. It's still going. Uh, we are replenishing our stock uh, the second or third time as we speak. Uh, shipments are on the way to Europe, and usually the uh, vessels that we have on stock and sale don't remain longer than two to three months on clock before they go. And um, this is something that our customers appreciate, having the opportunity in an emergency case to get fast supply. And uh, for that reason, it's, it's, it's a success story. So, so is, it, is it helping to gain some market share or to, uh, you know, to uh, service the client uh, more uh, you know, in, in a limited time? How they helping uh, overall profitability side as well as you know gaining the momentum with the client? Sorry, we could not hear you. Uh, sorry, your line is not very clear. No, is it is it better now? Come back on because it's not clear and it's difficult for us to understand the question. So do you mind just logging back on and getting in the queue? Sure, done. Thank you. Thank you so much.
The next question is from the line of uh, Omkar Kamtaker from Bonanza Portfolio. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, with, respect, with respect to the execution, so our order intake has been slow. That's not the issue from my perspective. But the order backlog has fallen by approximately 300 crores on a quarter on quarter basis. So we can say effectively on a positive side, the execution has improved. And we have done approximately 900 crores of revenue. And every quarter there has been a good, a fair bit of increase, especially in the last three quarters on a quarter on quarter basis. So can we say that the execution is starting to ramp up and this, uh, this execution level can sustain or maybe even improve say, for H2 and ahead? Yeah, the problem is that I think too much improvement in execution means that you eat into your backlog much faster, like you rightly said. But execution both in India, especially in international business, has been quite strong. Um, like many of you will know, we have three new facilities uh, in Germany, in Italy, and in China, which obviously are executing. The momentum is there. These factories were started maybe two and a half, three years ago, and it took us some time to ramp up. That's why you're seeing the significant improvement in revenue. You might remember that when we acquired the Forza business, international was about 175. Today they are close to 250, 300 odd million, right? So significant improvement in revenue that has only come from, I mean, come from two main areas. One is operational excellence or improvement in execution, and two, uh, pricing improvement, right? So we used to have, in when we were moving factories, changing from the old factory to the new factory, a lot of delays in delivery. But today, customers are very confident, they're very comfortable that when Fowler says that it's going to deliver in eight months, it's going to come in eight months, right? So that's the benefit. We need to definitely uh, continue with execution, and that's what we're working on. Uh, there could be opportunities to rationalize a little bit of manufacturing that uh, we have, and that's something that we're looking at as well. Uh, but otherwise, I think execution will continue. We need to focus on bringing in orders, which we all are quite, quite aligned. I think order intake has been quite strong in October. We hope that November and December are also quite strong when we are back at a decent level. Uh, and like I said, our business is not only dependent today on glass lines, so we're not only dependent on chemical and pharma. We have other businesses that cater to other industries as well. So in heavy engineering, for example, uh, last month we got a 75 crore order. We are currently working on a few other large projects, 50, 60 odd crore. The two of them were to materialize. Immediately we are now at the 2000 crore backlog mark. So again, the looking changed very quickly. Uh, and I believe that India will turn around much faster than the international business. India currently has a smaller backlog, so India needs to kind of uh, turn around faster. In, in the international business, like I mentioned, 30% also come from spare parts and services. That's always ongoing, so that's not part of the backlog, and that will add to the backlog every month. So that's the general overview in terms of backlog and in terms of the execution capabilities as well. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, with respect to the guidance, so the guidance I think would remain relatively unchanged because of the current run rate, we might just about fall maybe by a percent or two short of the FI24 estimate that was given in Q1. Uh, and we might we should be in line with the FI25 guidance, just to confirm. Yeah, so as management, we are clear that FI25 guidance, and I think in the past, as management, what we kind of uh, given out in terms of guidance, we have delivered on. And our primary goal and every single day when we wake up, we make sure that we are working towards achieving that goal. Uh, I don't see a reason why we should not be able to meet that goal. We might have to look at uh, certain deviations of strategy, certain changes in our strategy, a little bit more aggressive on pricing. Uh, but I think we all are in the same phase when it comes to that we need to meet these numbers. And we will work towards meeting these numbers and making sure that we deliver on the guidance. Okay. And just a uh, view on the mixing business. So the micro acquisition that we have done, although it is on on it, it is a small scale uh, vertical now, but how do you see that scaling up and what percentage of the total revenue that it might go, say, uh, maybe FI25 or FI26? How, what is the uh, guide, uh, guide way or pathway for that? 
uh, should go down. Yeah, today, when you add up our mixing business, and both Asim and Thomas will jump in with their views as well. Today, India is around 20 million, Mixer is around 15 million, just for the number 35, and let's say Mixer is another 7 8 million, right? So we had a 41 42 million mark as well, which puts us into kind of already in one of the bigger or the I mean, top five kind of companies in the world. Our focus is to build that business into at least a hundred million dollar business, double it uh, in the near term, in three to five year period. Uh, and we believe that there are more acquisition opportunities here as well. So that's something that we will always look at pursuing when something comes up. But even organically, now that we have these three facilities, we have PPR, we have access to new markets, we will then use our global uh, sales network and our ability to kind of combine the three mixing platforms into one and offer the same product ranges to multiple customers across multiple regions, right? So mixing is something that should go grow quite quite fast. We've seen significant improvement in the mixing business here in India, and we believe that internationally also over the next few quarters you will see mixing becoming stronger and stronger. Thomas, the team, do you want to say something here? Yeah, thank you much. I think the mixing business again is. Um, Market space is significantly bigger than the glass line market space, and this is one of the reasons why we have chosen this technology, a technology that we understand that was very adjacent to what we already do, and at the same time, it opens up market opportunities, market segments that we haven't been serving with our current product so far. And therefore, the close opportunities are certainly there. Uh, we are making ourselves uh, a stronger company with, with mixing, offering that, and organizationally we are working right now diligently and setting up an organization and what we call it a, a mixing division with um, a, 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 a leading, leading person coming from this industry, very experienced, uh, joining us beginning calendar year next year and putting all those uh, things together. And uh, as far as that, uh, we are working on several uh, decision opportunities around mixing as we speak, and uh, we have uh, further potential to, to, to go. Yeah. I'll just add, uh, I think Tarek and uh, Thomas have covered most uh, of the strategy things. I'll give you a couple of examples of how mixing makes a difference, right? Uh, so in India, recently we've uh, had some nice wins in new segments. So for example, in lithium uh, processing, uh, the specific agitators required, which we're working on, uh, in biorefining, uh, in gold um, 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 uh, gold beneficiation process as well, uh, we're supplying our um, uh, agitators. So these are new areas from our traditional chemical and pharmaceutical space, and it gives us you know, the ability to really uh, cover segments that we've traditionally not covered. Um, we've selected a few areas where we think we can make a difference and we'll continue to build our expertise, our PPRs, uh, so that we make a more compelling offer to our customers. Okay, thank you. So, so it would be prudent to assume that the mixing business will be growing much, much faster. And uh, it, it also, already, I think you mentioned 15 to 20% of the margin. So, so that will be good to assume. I think that's, reasonably, that's a reasonable assumption to me. And just a final a final uh, word on the uh, working capital. So in the current uh, quarter, we've seen approximately 220 crore uh, hit on, hit because of the working capital. So how are we going to optimize that, or is this just a one-off thing, or, or is this going to be, be maybe prolonged for some time? I think that has gone into the base now. So I think uh, as on first October we start with a uh, fresh base. So so H2 and H2 H2 and H1 will be completely different. Uh, part A, uh, Part B. Uh, there are a uh, few initiatives which we've already started working upon, and uh, uh, you know, as you, you see the results hopefully in the end of March, uh, results as we have, and as and when we come out. Okay. And to your previous question on Mixel, I think a uh, couple of months back we uploaded a Mixel presentation, and uh, there is that, that much more detail is there, is, and you can refer that as well. And there's a 25% growth that is being given on for next four five years. Okay, so, okay. Mixing, uh, on the mixing presentation. Okay, thank, thank you, and the best wishes for the festivities. Thank you. thank you so much. The next question is from the line of uh, Raj Shah from Marcellus Investment Managers. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So, my question was uh, related to the unbuilt revenues uh, amount. Uh, in March 23, the 
uh, amount was around 100 crores. I just want to know how that amount has moved uh, uh, as an subject. So the uh, uh, that's the unfair revenue amount, uh, as I said, uh, with regard to Mawas primary, has increased at something to 56 uh, crores. So to that extent, uh, that amount uh, increases. Okay. And and how do you expect this amount to uh, move uh, uh, by the year end? Uh, I think it should be more or less be stable, and uh, uh, this is a smaller reduction because as you said, you go through uh, the base, uh, you know, the revenue uh, base increases. But I think at this stage we are uh, slightly on a higher side, so you can say a marginal improvement uh, as we go along. Mar marginal reduction. Uh, in the, the, uh, oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Thank you so much. The next question is from the line of Ritesh Shah, who is an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. This is Ritesh from Investor Capital. Uh, so I just wanted to understand the business case for uh, mixing technology. Uh, that's one. So uh, you did indicate examples for lithium and gold. Uh, this is quite niche uh, as far as the Indian markets are there. Uh, do we supply to any other non-ferrous majors like of Indalco's, Vedantas of this world? And if yes, so what is it substituting right now, or is it something which is new that we are offering to the companies? Yeah, so as far as minerals and mining are concerned, I gave those two as examples. We do provide adaptation solutions to a wider range of uh, um, minerals and mining uh, cases. Uh, while I can't take specific customer names for confidentiality reasons, certainly we do cover uh, other areas. Um, and as far as you know, what we are replacing, uh, there is usually an existing agitation solution, but the way we design our agitator, that it gives them better productivity or more efficiency um, in terms of power consumption. And that is what actually enables our sales vis-a-vis -vis their existing solution. So just to add to this, I think the, so I think in the past, when these plants were built, uh, especially in metals and minerals, in um, you know, oil and gas, petrochemicals, a lot of PCR was required. So most of these PCRs were already expected, which would mean that these inquiries would only go to certain vendors. So in most cases, we do compete with the global uh, biggies when it comes to mixing. However, we made a name for ourselves here in India. And now this P2 acquisition that we have done, we have also bought PTR, right? So for example, Mixer has very strong PTR in terms of industry. Mixer on the other has very strong PTR in other industry segments. So we don't really have a lot of overlap. So when we combine the three businesses, we have really a much wider range of industry segments and PTR that we can use. The idea is to bring it all together and package it together under one umbrella of mixing and then go out and then target the customer base saying, hey, we can now cater to a much wider range of industries. Like I said earlier, mixing helps customers either reduce batch time, which means they can produce more. You can reduce your power consumption, which means your costs go down. You can improve the quality of your product, means you get more money. So there's multiple benefits that the customer can touch and feel, and that's why mixing is very, very important. And that's why we have decided as a technology leader to go after mixing in a big way because it fits perfectly with the portfolio, it's complementary, there are synergies. Mixing is something we speak about with our chemical and pharma customers, but now we can speak about it to a much wider range of customers as well. All right, uh, sir, I appreciate your comments. Uh, so, uh, to my understanding, last time equipment is far, far critical, right? So, you will have some pricing power and we can call out on margins what we want. Uh, how critical is mixing as a technology when you look at uh, any of the ferrous or non-ferrous majors? Because it will be a very small part of the value chain to my understanding. Uh, so will it fare the same level of margins, ROC, that we look at uh, when we look at our traditional or core businesses? Yeah, so the big project that we have done where we were competing with international players, we did a fermentation project where we were competing with a Chinese company and we must have made, I think, higher than 30% uh, EBITDA margin uh, in those specific ad stages, right? So these are all critical, um, uh, especially when it's critical and you cannot take any kind of risk, the customer cannot take a risk, then they have to make sure that they pay for uh, and compared to manufacturing outside of India, so let's say you're competing with a German, a, uh, 
French or a Chinese player, our cost of manufacturing in India is much lower, so we are maybe 25 30% cheaper. But because of our lower cost, we make significant improvement in margin. So, listing generally is a profitable business, uh, it's changed a lot, um, and in most cases, uh, the mixing business will probably give you better margins than uh, last line, uh, and that's the idea of really growing the mixing business. Sure, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shyam Maheshwari from Aditya Birla Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Karak and team, and uh, congratulations on the good set of numbers. Yeah, uh, just had a couple of questions. One on the international business. Uh, when I look at the gross margins this quarter, they are a little off uh, the numbers that we usually post, by around three to four percent. Uh, wanted to understand, you know, uh, why that is. Is there some competitive pricing that you're seeing there? Is it some acquisition-related integration costs that well, are probably one of the nature? So if you would so like the, the international business you're talking about, the India business. Yeah, I get that. Sorry. Uh, the international business. International. There's uh, it's slightly lower. What is lower? You said sorry, gross margin. The gross margins, gross margins. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, happening yeah. product mix. So maybe yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I think in the international mix, uh, business, the technology business has been uh, you know in this quarter has been a bit on the higher side, and as you would imagine, uh, technology would consume that much more raw material, and that is the main reason for this uh, higher increase in the uh, material cost line. Actually. Right, so this is probably a mix uh, related uh, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. no competitive uh, kind of pressure as such. Yeah, it's primarily on the mix side. I mean, competitive pressure is there now. I mean, if the market were to slow down, you know, obviously there is more people buying for the same kind of order book. There is definitely more competitive pressure. I would say Europe and international US is not as intense as we've seen, at least here in India. Uh, but I think in, in India we've done quite well with maintaining or maybe even improving market share in glass line. So our order book in glass line the last couple of months has been quite strong. We expect some more large orders to finalize in the near future. So uh, from that perspective, uh, I think uh, both international and glass line margins could probably see an improvement if the market were to kind of uh, turn and the demand were to increase. The revenues that you see right now, they are not under competitive pressure because the revenues um, from the last quarter were uh, order intakes from eight months ago. I understand. Um, second question was just on the outlook uh, of the chemical industry as such. You know, we have guided for growth beyond FY25 as well. Uh, Viner order in right now are muted. You know what gives you the confidence that uh, the chemical industry will come back? And maybe if you could give a uh, kind of a breakup between like agrochemical, specialty chemical, which sector we are seeing maybe some sort of pickup happening in the recent month. So I probably was hoping to ask you the same question in terms of what do you think about <laughs> chemical uh, because you probably are tracking and following more chemical companies than we are. But I think what gives us confidence is that. One of some of the projects that was supposed to be finalized maybe six months ago has finally started kind of people are sending us inquiries, they finalized on their equipment uh, and they are now getting into the negotiation phase, right? Uh, that started to happen uh, and I think that gives us a little bit more confidence because earlier maybe maybe a quarter ago or two, three months ago we did not have that confidence that things would. Uh, things have got pushed out, but I think things are now. The I mean, in terms of the chemical industry, when I say chemical, it's really agrochemical. The bottom has been breached. I don't think there's any further kind of uh, downside there. So, if anything, things are going to improve. Raw material prices have also stabilized. Uh, like you must be knowing, uh, many of the uh, much of the overstocking is going to get consumed. Uh, and then obviously U.S. Brazil will start ordering again, so we will see a ramp up uh, of the chemical industry, mainly agrochemicals. Specialty pharma has been decent; uh, they have been kind of doing okay. Uh, you know, people building like CP, uh, you know, CPVC, PVC, epistorol, all these kind of specialty chemicals continue to do quite okay, and then pharma is picking up. So. All in all, I think the whole situation, even though has, I mean, you know, chemicals is cyclical. We've always known this. Obviously, we've been in a 
an up cycle for the last maybe five to six years, so people didn't realize that there's also a down cycle. I think the idea is when there's a down cycle, we should be aware and we should make sure that we have control of our costs and make sure that we don't lose market share, which we are doing. And as soon as the markets are returned, I think we will be in a strong position to take this opportunity and make sure that we are again uh, in a strong position. And that's it. Thanks for answering all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of uh, Sarang Sanil from RW Investment Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. I hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So, <clears throat> so uh, my first question is, what is that you're doing differently in the international business now, which is uh, clearly getting reflected on your margins? Is it the capacity utilization, headcount rationalization, or have there been any revamps in the existing facilities? I mean, what are the top levers apart from uh, the a better pricing that you get? So maybe Alex, you can take this question. The question is, what are you doing differently in the international business so that your profit margins have improved significantly from about seven and a half percent, not about two and a half, three years ago, to now nearly fifteen percent? So what Thomas mentioned before, a lot of the orders that you currently see in our CMA, they were offered when we had the peak for energy prices raw material last year. So we were able to increase our prices further. And in the meantime, the cost structure stabilized again, and therefore we benefit from the higher, so called the better price business with the lower cost structure now. Right, and I think the other thing that maybe from the pricing improvement that we did, but also the execution in the facilities, namely Germany, China, Italy. I think these are new facilities. They took some time to ramp up, but now the momentum is going strong, and we are getting good absorption of the fixed cost. Having said that, we always also look at, and maybe Thomas can talk a little bit about. Uh, the employee cost generally, and what we have done over the last few months to make sure that we are more efficient. Yeah, and then the cost, of course, we had increases due to the inflation in all the regions. Um, uh, again, we have been able to um, manage to, to increase our prices accordingly. That was not uh, significantly difficult because um, all our customers had the same uh, story, the same issue, the stop. Uh, but at the same time, we were able to increase productivity to operation excellence programs to, 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 to uh, also combining, um, let's say, um, better, 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 better um, operational um, processes and, and the productivity increase, and this is what how we how we counter those cost increases. So my second question is: uh, When I see your margins in the last two years, in Q4 there is a bump up in other expense as a percentage of revenue. So is there any big expense that uh, you incur in Q4, and is it something we can expect going forward? Yes. So there is a uh, in Q4 there is usually a a bonus or you pay your incentives, right? International. There's, there's something in Q4 last Q4 that we have the new salary or we have the calendar. January is the new calendar where they have the higher salary that you pay normally. Right? So the uh, the margin, the appraisal cycle is in first, yeah, yeah. first January, which happens to be Q4 for us. So employee expenses generally go up uh, for the in, Yeah, in Q4, but I think generally for the year, you will see that we are around what we've guided to work. But yes, Q4, you will see a slight increase in employee expenses in the international business. I meant in other expenses. Oh, so I think uh, exactly references to last year or uh, Q4. Probably we may not have something uh, after immediately to your uh, to your mind, but I think there, there would be a few uh, legal expenses they were there on account of uh, acquisition of the bank, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I, say, I, I, I assume that you refer to the cost that we spent for the acquisitions and for the. Let me say you remember that we also tried to dispose the Atlon business. And um, for the year end, we in fact we accrued all the costs for this. So this is more or less considered as a one time impact. So please do not consider going forward that in the Q4 we always see a significant bump in the other operating expenses. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and my final question is uh, is the effective tax rate being the 26 20 cents range only for this year? Because first two quarters we saw a little on the higher side, right? Yes. 
for the international okay. business. But hey, we, we always have some um, changes in the tax rate. I think in general we gave the guidance to consider a rate of 27 to 28%. Yeah, between the quarters, some uh, changes, but I would consider that for this quarter, we are at the 25, 27% rate again. So, um, yeah, for, for the full year, you will see. According with our published digital reconciliation, where you see the impact due to the third taxes, due to the fiscal units that we have globally. So, um, but the general guidance remain at the 27%. Got it, got it. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we would take that as our last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us to this call. I think most of the uh, comments that we made today uh, will kind of show to you that we have line of sight in terms of where we want to be. Uh, we obviously have now also a shareholder who has come in recently and we will be engaging with them as well to kind of build uh, strategies and see areas of improvement. Uh, and that we will obviously kind of look to maybe at some point uh, look to give you guidance maybe more than FY25, which we are currently uh, have guided towards. Uh, having said that, we also have some specific strategies for acquisitions and any opportunities that we continue to look at. So that's something that we will continue to do. And then lastly, like I said, we are making sure that our cost structure remains uh, intact and that we can look at operational efficiency to help improve margins. Uh, and uh, hopefully the market is starting to turn uh, and there is some uh, the uptake and if the market were to kind of turn around much faster then obviously the demand goes up which means then everybody kind of increases prices so that will help also in terms of profitability but generally I think we have uh, we performed quite well for the first half of the year and we expect to continue with the momentum for the next half as well and we look forward to speaking with you at the end of Q3. Uh, Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. On behalf of GMM Fodler, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.